You are listening to the Philosophy Podcast presented by LearnOutLoud.com. Here we will periodically showcase audio renditions of great works from philosophers such as Plato, Aristotle, Descartes, Kant, Nietzsche, and beyond. For a complete listing of the Learn Out Loud podcasts with links to subscribe, please visit our website at www.learnoutloud.com slash podcast. Thank you for listening. The Poetics of Aristotle Written in approximately 350 B.C. Translated by Samuel Henry Butcher Excerpt on the Definition and Plot of Tragedy Definition of Tragedy Let us now discuss tragedy, resuming its formal definition, as resulting from what has already been said. Tragedy, then, is an imitation of an action that is serious, complete, and of a certain magnitude. In language embellished with each kind of artistic ornament, the several kinds being found in separate parts of the play, in the form of action, not of narrative, through pity and fear affecting the proper purgation of these emotions. By language embellished, I mean language into which rhythm, harmony, and song enter. By the several kinds in separate parts, I mean that some parts are rendered through the medium of verse alone, others again with the aid of song. Now, as tragic imitation implies persons acting, it necessarily follows, in the first place, that spectacular equipment will be part of tragedy. Next, song and diction, for these are the medium of imitation. By diction, I mean the mere metrical arrangement of the words. As for song, it is a term whose sense everyone understands. Again, tragedy is the imitation of an action and an action implies personal agents who necessarily possess certain distinctive qualities both of character and thought, for it is by these that we qualify actions themselves, and these, thought and character, are the two natural causes from which actions spring. And on actions again all success or failure depends. Hence, the plot is the imitation of the action. For by plot I here mean the arrangement of the incidents. By character, I mean that in virtue of which we ascribe certain qualities to the agents. Thought is required wherever a statement is proved, or it may be a general truth enunciated. Every tragedy, therefore, must have six parts, which parts determine its quality, namely, plot, character, diction, thought, spectacle, song. Two of the parts constitute the medium of imitation, one, the manner, and three, the objects of imitation, and these complete the list. These elements have been employed, we may say, by the poets to a man. In fact, every play contains spectacular elements as well as character, plot, diction, song, and thought. But most important of all is the structure of the incidents, for tragedy is an imitation not of men, but of an action and of life, and life consists in action, and its end is a mode of action, not a quality. Now character determines men's qualities, but it is by their actions that they are happy or the reverse. Dramatic action, therefore, is not with a view to the representation of character. Character comes in as a subsidiary to the actions. Hence, the incidents and the plot are the end of a tragedy, and the end is the chief thing of all. Again, without action there cannot be a tragedy. There may be without character. The tragedies of most of our modern poets fail in the rendering of character, and of poets in general this is often true. It is the same in painting, and here lies the difference between Xuxus and Polygnotus. Polygnotus delineates character well. The style of Xuxus is devoid of ethical quality. Again, if you string together a set of speeches expressive of character and well finished in point of diction and thought, you will not produce the essential tragic effect nearly so well as with a play which, however deficient in these respects, yet has a plot and artistically constructed incidents, besides which the most powerful elements of emotional, interest in tragedy, peripatia, or reversal of the situation, and recognition scenes, are parts of the plot. A further proof is that of novices in the art attain to finish, of diction and precision of portraiture before they can construct the plot. It is the same with almost all the early poets. The plot, then, is the first principle, and as it were, the soul of the tragedy. Character holds the second place. A similar fact is seen in painting. The most beautiful colors laid on confusedly will not give as much pleasure as the chalk outline of a portrait. 
Thus tragedy is the imitation of an action, and of the agents mainly with a view to the action. Third in order is thought, that is, the faculty of saying what is possible and pertinent in given circumstances. In the case of oratory, this is the function of the political art, and of the art of rhetoric, and so indeed the older poets make their characters speak the language of civic life, the poets of our time, the language of the rhetoricians. Character is that which reveals moral purpose, showing what kind of things a man chooses or avoids. Speeches, therefore, which do not make this manifest, or in which the speaker does not choose or avoid anything whatever, are not expressive of character. Thought, on the other hand, is found where something is proved to be, or not to be, or a general maxim is enunciated. Fourth among the elements enumerated comes diction, by which I mean, as has already been said, the expression of the meaning in words and its essence is the same both in verse and prose. Of the remaining elements, song holds the chief place among the embellishments. The spectacle has, indeed, an emotional attraction of its own, but of all the parts it is the least artistic, and connected least with the art of poetry. For the power of tragedy, we may be sure, is felt even apart from representation and actors. Besides, the production of spectacular effects depends more on the art of the stage machinist than on that of the poet. 7. The plot must be a whole. These principles being established, let us now discuss the proper structure of the plot, since this is the first and most important thing in tragedy. Now, according to our definition, tragedy is an imitation of an action that is complete and whole, and of a certain magnitude, for there may be a whole that is wanting in magnitude. A whole is that which has a beginning, a middle, and an end. A beginning is that which does not itself allow anything but causal necessity, but after which something naturally is or comes to be. An end, on the contrary, is that which itself naturally follows some other thing, either by necessity or as a rule, but has nothing following it. A middle is that which follows something as some other thing follows it. A well-constructed plot, therefore, must neither begin nor end at haphazard, but conform to these principles. Again, a beautiful object, whether it be a living organism or any whole composed of parts, must not only have an orderly arrangement of parts, but must also be of a certain magnitude, for beauty depends on magnitude and order. Hence, a very small animal organism cannot be beautiful, for the view of it is confused the object being seen in an almost imperceptible moment of time. Nor again can one of vast size be beautiful, for as the eye cannot take it all in at once, the unity and sense of the whole is lost for the spectator. As, for instance, if there were one a thousand miles long. As, therefore, in the case of animate bodies and organisms, a certain magnitude is necessary, and a magnitude which may be easily embraced in one view, so in the plot a certain length is necessary and a length which can be easily embraced by the memory. The limit of length, in relation to dramatic competition and sensuous presentment, is no part of artistic theory. For had it been the rule for a hundred tragedies to compete together, the performance would have been regulated by the water clock, as indeed we were told was formerly done. The greater the length, the more beautiful will the piece be by reason of its size, provided that the whole be perspicuous. And to define the matter roughly, we may say that the proper magnitude is comprised within such limits, that the sequence of events, according to the law of probability or necessity, will admit of a change from bad fortune to good, or from good fortune to bad. 8. The plot must be a unity. Unity of plot does not, as some persons think, consist in the unity of the hero. For infinitely various are the incidents in one man's life which cannot be reduced to unity, and so too there are many actions of one man out of which we cannot make one action. Hence the error, as it appears of all poets who have composed a Heraclid, a Theseid, or other poems of the kind. They imagine that as Heracles was one man, the story of Heracles must also be a unity. But Homer, as in all else he is of surpassing merit, here too, whether from art or natural genius, seems to have happily discerned the truth. In composing the Odyssey, he did not include all the adventures of Odysseus, such as his wound on Parnassus or his feigned madness at the mustering of the host, incidents between which there was no necessary or probable connection, but he made the Odyssey 
and likewise the Iliad, to center around an action that in our sense of the word is one. As therefore in the other imitative arts, the imitation is one when the object imitated is one. So the plot, being an imitation of an action, must imitate one action, and that a whole, the structural union of the parts being such that if any one of them is displaced or removed, the whole will be disjointed and disturbed. For a thing whose presence or absence makes no visible difference is not an organic part of the whole. 9. Dramatic Unity it is, moreover, evident from what has been said that it is not the function of the poet to relate what has happened, but what may happen, what is possible according to the law of probability or necessity. The poet and the historian differ not by writing in verse or in prose. The work of Herodotus might be put into verse, and it would still be a species of history, with meter no less than without it. The true difference is that one relates what has happened, the other what may happen. Poetry, therefore, is a more philosophical and a higher thing than history. For poetry tends to express the universal, history the particular. By the universal I mean how a person of a certain type will on occasion speak or act, according to the law of probability or necessity. And it is this universality at which poetry aims in the names she attaches to the personages. The particular is, for example, what Alcibiades did or suffered. In comedy this is already apparent, for here the poet first constructs the plot on the lines of probability, and then inserts characteristic names, unlike the lampooners who write about particular individuals. But tragedians still keep to real names, the reason being that what is possible is credible. What has not happened, we do not at once feel sure to be possible, but what has happened is manifestly possible, otherwise it would not have happened. Still, there are even some tragedies in which there are only one or two well-known names, the rest being fictitious. In others, none are well-known, as in Agathon's Antheus, where incidents and names alike are fictitious, and yet they give nonetheless pleasure. We must not, therefore, at all costs keep to the received legends which are the usual subjects of tragedy. Indeed, it would be absurd to attempt it, for even subjects that are known are known only to a few, and yet give pleasure to all. It clearly follows that the poet, or maker, should be the maker of plots rather than of verses, since he is a poet because he imitates, and what he imitates are actions. And even if he chances to take an historical subject, he is nonetheless a poet. For there is no reason why some events that actually have happened should not conform to the law of the probable and possible, and in virtue of that quality in them, he is their poet or maker. Of all plots and actions, the episodic are the worst. I call a plot episodic, in which the episodes or acts succeed one another without probable or necessary sequence. Bad poets compose such pieces by their own fault, good poets to please the players, for as they write show pieces for competition, they stretch the plot beyond its capacity and are often forced to break the natural continuity. But again, tragedy is an imitation not only of a complete action, but of events inspiring fear or pity. Such an effect is best produced when the events come on us by surprise, and the effect is heightened when at the same time they follow as cause and effect. The tragic wonder will then be greater than if they happen by themselves or by accident, for even coincidences are most striking when they have an air of design. We may, for instance, take the statue of Mites at Argos, which fell upon his murderer while he was a spectator at a festival and killed him. Such events seem not to be due to mere chance. Plots, therefore, constructed on these principles are necessarily the best.